How did this happen? How did this happen? Right. Um, well, I um, was on the board of health, actually, not not school nurse, but oh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, I but um, yeah, I I was in my yard having my septic system pumped, and the guy said, uh, "What do you do?" And I said, "Well, I'm a nurse." And he said, "Well." Um, we need a nurse on the Board of Health because our Board of Health nurse broke her leg and uh, she doesn't want to be there anymore. And my husband said, that's great. You love that. I'll watch the baby and you can do this. And from then on, he has been so sorry. <laughs> so what happened was, um, as I was working on the Board of Health doing different things, I grew up in Uxbridge and my doctor was Dr. Mulcahy. And Dr. Mulcahy was old then, and I started to think about that. And now I think he was probably really young, but and, you know, things change as you get old. But I knew that he was going to not be practicing for a long time, and I started to think about it. And I thought about uh, White and Soil had Dr. Sullivan. He was old. Dr. The, Cukin was in uh, Upton, and, and then I started doing all this research of all the towns in the community, and I thought, holy mackerel, we're going to be more underserved than Appalachia. So I went over to visit with um, Mrs. Pottles and Mr. Fabada, who were on the Board of Health at that time as well, and I said, you know, did, have you thought about this? And they looked at me like, what do you mean? <laughs> and I said, we're, we're not going to have any docs here. And at the same time, coincidentally, I had read this article of, uh, about Dorchester. There was, uh, in uh, the community, they were underserved. They had no docs. And uh, they built a facility and built it and they will come. And, and that, that's how it worked. And I said, you know, that's something that you know maybe we can think about and so um, as they were doing different things and they were talking about it and so uh, long story longer we ended up uh, getting together as a, a community all the different towns I went to every single town and talked to every single person and we got together and said, you know, that's, that's really true. We could do something like they did in Dorchester. Um, so we um, started fundraising. And how we did our fundraising was we had food sales, you know, out in the, the public the facility down, down near the Board of Health. We would have all this baking and people would buy stuff. And, we put that money aside, and then we would knock on doors and say to tell the story and, and, and get money that way and do all these different things. Um, and um, finally, we, we were talking about seeing if we could get a mortgage to, you know, build a facility because I went to, and you know, I, I really was a kid. and as kids are kind of stupid and thinking idealistic, I'm like a Pollyanna, you know? And so I went to see Amory Aldridge, who was at that time like a, a very older gentleman, and he was um, a Yankee to the core. And uh, so I made an appointment, went in to see him, and I said to him, this is what we're doing. We've got a whole group, we're doing all things. We, we had dances that people had to pay to come in. And, you know, it was a fun uh, event at the, like at the lake at Nipmuc, um, at the facility there. We did a couple of, two or three years in a row, we did dances. And so I was telling him about it. And he said to me, well, if you can raise $10,000, I'll give you a mortgage. And I was like, He's still my son, you know. So from then on, you know, we all got together and did it, and it worked, and we got the mortgage, and the rest is history, as they say, you know. And Joyce, this is nineteen seventy-five, five, five. five. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. ten thousand dollars was yeah, 
Uh, it was crazy. And at the same time, uh, I'm, I'm sorry that Larry's not here because his mother was my Girl Scout leader in, in Oxbridge. And uh, she came to me and she said, you know, if this, this uh, you get this to work, if it gets to work, I will give you the land. And, and I was like, are you kidding me? No, we'll make it work. We're going to make this work, you know. And, and we did. I mean, it was a lot of work. And it was, you know, things that, you know, we kept going and kept moving and doing and seeing and getting. <laughs> so, I mean, really, that's, yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. The, um, so, actually, Tri River is a pretty unique um, entity, and I think it, it occurred because of multiple things kind of happening in concert. Um, I was in the public health service. Um, I had been an impoverished medical student and took a scholarship from the National Health Service Corps and owed them three years of service in an underserved area. Um, and so I was recruited here um, as an um, indentured servant in a way because I owed them time and you know, they were going to send me somewhere. I looked at some pretty rural places, you know, Kezar Falls, Maine, or Dexter, Maine, and other sorts of things. Um, but there were other things going on at the same time. One was the movement towards uh, community health centers. <clears throat> Um, the first community health center was built in uh, Dorchester in, in, um, in uh, 1965. Um, uh, actually, Michelle and I went to a event at the Kennedy Library where Edward Kennedy, who was the sponsor of that, um, was celebrating the 50th uh, anniversary of that uh, having occurred. Um, the uh, scholarship program was uh, happening. The, the UMass Medical School had been um, founded in 1962, but didn't graduate its initial class until 1974. Uh, I'm fond of saying I didn't go to UMass Medical School because it wasn't there. <laughs> um, and actually, it's a little bit of an overstatement, but um, the uh, I would have been in the third graduating class of the medical school at that time. They were in the Shaw Building. I don't know if you know the the, the you know that that's that kind of semicircular building at the base of the hill uh, where Lake Street meets um, Belmont Belmont Street, right? Um, and they were graduating 16 people in a class. And uh, they were sold to the legislature as a good idea because they were going to do something that the three schools in Boston were not doing. Namely, they were going to train people to be primary care docs. And they were also going to uh, provide um, uh, physicians to underserved areas of Massachusetts. So obviously, um, the fact that we were within commuting distance of Worcester made us an attractive um, uh, affiliate, um, and so uh, with the work that Joyce and her um, colleagues had done, uh, the medical school came to talk to them. Now, the medical school actually had some expertise in terms of getting this area federally designated as an underserved area, which was pretty important because um, that meant that public health service people could be assigned here. Um, they were looking for a place to train people too, and actually almost almost coincident with my arrival in Uxbridge, um, uh, medical residents showed up to do clinics here. Um, when I interviewed for the job, and actually when David interviewed for the job as well, um, the practice was in a two-bedroom apartment in the Patrick Henry Apartments. I forget what number. Was it eight? I don't know. I don't know. But, but um, it's kind of an interesting arrangement. One bedroom was the exam room for internal medicine, and another bedroom was the exam room for pediatrics, and the living room was the waiting room. 
and the kitchen was the lab. And that was kind of the way the thing worked. Right? There was a bathroom, too. There was a bathroom. <laughs> there was a bathroom. But uh, suffice it to say, at that point, they had gotten the approval to build the building. Um, the generosity of Mrs. Boss. I have a, a copy of a handwritten note, literally a handwritten note, saying I'm going to give this two acres of land. You know, um, um, you know, sincerely, Ruth Boss. Um, uh, one of the background stories of that, though, is her husband, Lawrence Boss, had been the president of the Uxbridge Savings Bank. He was a very civically minded person. And he's the original board chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Tri River Development Corporation. He unfortunately had a heart attack and died in 1976. It said that he was supposed to give a talk to the selectmen about Tri River the next day. And I hope that didn't kind of um, prove to be too stressful. <laughs> um, but so the, the Voss family was really, you know, both from the standpoint that he was an initial supporter and also from the standpoint that she donated the land. Um, and actually when we added on, she sold us the adjacent land for I think $7,000, which I know land is not hugely expensive in Uxbridge, but $7,000 for an acre of land is pretty cheap. Um, so we interviewed at the, um, at the um, apartment and they showed me that the building was being built. So this was my first choice and I was uh, chagrined to learn that they had chosen somebody else. Um, now I think I told Bob Ross that I, if he chose me I would stay a long time. I was originally from Massachusetts, so this was kind of close to home. But he chose someone who was from Iowa. Um, and uh, fortunately, he turned the job down and actually went to Dorchester. And he stayed in Dorchester for 40 years, and I stayed here for 40 years. Um, the, um, so everything was going okay at that point. There was an internist here named Phil Riley, and uh, he was going to be my partner. And so uh, as I was about to pack my bags in Madison, Wisconsin, where I was a resident, I got a call from Bob Ross saying, uh, how are things? Glad you're coming, so forth and so on. And oh, by the way, Phil's leaving. Um, which, you know, was kind of um, unfortunate. <laughs> because when I arrived here, um, that meant that I had no one to practice with. I was 29 years old. I had just finished my training. You become acutely aware of all the things that you were not taught or didn't know. Um, doctors in uh, Milford and so forth wanted me to join their coverage groups. Um, now, I didn't know too much, but it did occur to me that they had lots of patients and I had none. So if I was on call, the only calls I was going to get were from their patients. So I decided that I was going to be on call all the time. Uh, I did get a few calls, but not, not, not that many. And then I was able to recruit uh, Charlie Sweet, who came um, a few months later. Um, and then a year later, we recruited Frank Gilroy. Um, the, um, the early days of Tri River were interesting. You know, people would come kind of shopping for a doctor. They often would say, gee, you don't look old enough to be a doctor. I kind of miss that. <laughs> um, you know, they'd say, oh, you remind me of my son, or you remind me of my grandson. Um, uh, Dr. Mulcahy was born in 1913, so if you do the math, he was you know, in his mid-60s when we arrived. 
I could always tell a Dr. Mulcahy patient because they always came with a little flask of urine. And they would put it down on the desk and say, there it is, doc. You know? And I never quite understood what to do with it. But, uh, but I always knew that they, <laughs> that they, were, uh, they were Dr. Mulcahy's patients. You know, that, that, was kind of the, uh, that was kind of the deal. Now, there were certain things that were kind of challenges. <clears throat> One was uh, Milford looked upon us with great um, suspicion because um, they didn't want a um, metastasis of the medical center in their backyard. And there was actually um, a memorandum of understanding about the fact that we would hospitalize people at Milford whenever it was clinically appropriate, and that we would use specialists in Milford whenever it was clinically appropriate. Um, there was an initial memorandum agreement that's got like eight or ten signatures on it, and then there was a second more um, detailed memorandum agreement. Um, following which they made a donation to our building fund. They donated $20,000 to the Triver Building Fund. Now, Joyce and her colleagues had raised $35,000. Now, they initially thought they were going to have to raise $100,000. But with uh, Mrs. Voss giving them the land, you know, $55,000 was pretty good. I used to tell uh, Frank Sabo when he was chair, uh, when he was the CEO of Milford, that was the best twenty thousand dollar investment you ever made. You know, and actually, of course, now with the pending merger of UMass and Milford, um, it looks even even better. The people in Whitensville, though, thought we were communists. Now, you have to realize I came as a, in a tidy package as a federal employee who was also working for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, somehow. Now, David was a federal employee, but he was a volunteer employee, meaning he didn't have a scholarship. He was just a good guy doing a noble thing. <laughs> and I was, you know, I was just trying to stay out of South Dakota or something like that. You know, and the joke in my family was I was going to end up um, in Carvel, Louisiana. Now, I don't know if you know, Carvel, Louisiana is the only place in the United States that takes care of people with leprosy. And so I was going to become a authority on leprosy because they were going to send me there, you know. But they sent me to Oxford. No, but the people in uh, Whitensill thought that we were unfair competition, um, that we were a federally funded facility. Um, they had succeeded in getting Phil Riley to leave here and go into practice. They would come up to me and say, well, we know you have that three-year obligation, but I assume that, you know, once you're done with that, you'll do the honorable thing and go with the private practice. Of course, never did that. And private practice pretty much doesn't exist anymore. So I used to tell people that I was the first salary primary care doc in Milford. Um, but, um, you know, so they thought we were communists, and they thought, uh, and there's actually a letter that I found in the archives that basically wants to run us out of town. They, um, you know, they say we're unfair competition, you know, da 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 da. Um, that they, they always envisioned this as a place that would recruit people in the area and then they would go into practice, and they were saying, probably with some degree of validity, that it would make it possible for them to recruit people. Um, but so we, we, we started out. And you know, recall, people who were from this area, there were actually two hospitals um, back then. There was the White and Soul Hospital, 
which had about 20 inpatient beds. And then there was Milford Hospital. And they had become the Milford Whitensill Hospital in 1974. So again, there were a lot of things going on kind of in concert. There was the scholarship program. There was the community health center movement. There was the formation of the medical school. There was the um, um, collaborative relationship among the people in the towns. Um, and that's how we started. Um, the, uh, maybe I'll leave time for questions. And I also, um, that's great, that's really uh, helpful to give us the background, really inspirational. Uh, I have uh, two questions. If you could circle back and explain who Bob Ross, who oh. role was, and when David arrived in the theater, if you wanted to say a few words also. Yeah, well, Bob Ross was our original medical director. He was um, in his late 50s, I think, when he initially was recruited or mid-50s anyway. He had run an HMO in Colorado, and he'd also run a clinic in upstate New York. Um, he was, you know, we were all kind of newbies, and so it was good to have somebody who had been at it for a while. But he was, um, he was, you know, the original medical director. Now, one of the things that was different about our clinic, a couple of things, one is that we were not set up as a federally qualified health center. Now, federally qualified health centers like the uh, Great Brook Valley Health Center that later became the Edward M. Kennedy Health Center, those health centers get direct funding from the, the feds. But in order to qualify for that, your board has to be a controlling board, and they have to be higher in firepower and so forth. And the fact that UMass was involved in this uh, kind of disqualified us for that. There was an audit from the Public Health Service saying, gee, you're really not supposed to do it that way. And, you know, it even kind of implied that Dr. Muller and Dr. Tapsco I may not have to stay or something, you know, I don't know. Uh, but we got over that. But we, so, uh, but the other thing was that uh, of the, um, health centers in the UMass system, we're the only one that's not a family medicine health center. You know, we're an internal medicine and pediatric center. You'll read from this that Hugh Fulmer, who was the head of family medicine, was the UMass person involved. But somewhere along the line, I'm sure that Dr. Dolan, who was the head of medicine, said, we can do primary care, you guys get the hell out of the way. You know, so he, he was feeling a little bit um, put upon that, you know, that we didn't have a piece of the uh, primary care action. Uh, what was the second question? So just for David to talk oh, David. The other thing yeah. I just wanted to say is, you know, that your community board remained even after I came in 1992 mm -hmm. as the... Right. It, the Into, two, uh, into 2000, I think. Yeah, was it was 2000? Way, was it? Yeah, yeah, way in. Yeah, and so, and UMass sort of provided positions, but the community board maintained the building and, and did all of that. And then in 2000, it um, was kind of handed over to the uh, UMass Memorial Health Care Inc. After, after we had paid all of the, the mortgages and stuff like that. And, and the board so, sort of decreased people. Uh, because I actually was the youngest person there, and Ken Redding, Ken and I, and we're the only survivors still now yet. Um, uh, and, and as I always say, uh, when I, we started, both Phil and I had long black hair. <laughs> just, just so mine was, and mine was as long as hers was. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know. the right, David? Yeah, I had long hair. <laughs> Actually, shaved half of it off in medical school. Uh, just let me fill in for a few minutes some of the uh, more quaint history. Uh, yeah, I, I was trained in Providence, and uh, I sort of jumped at the chance to have a job and not have to go into private practice, which was really a daunting prospect. Uh, you know, near Providence, because it's half an hour from Providence, and so I, I jumped at the chance and came up to the Patrick Henry Apartments, which are that way, 
And then I walked into the uh, Patrick Henry apartments, and there was this older gentleman who was in his 50s, Bob Ross, and he looked, and he had a white jacket on, and you know, like a medical student, and, and all of that, and sat down in the lab, which was the kitchen. And, uh, and it was me and uh, a sort of top shot pediatrician from Children's Hospital in Boston named Norma Lerner, and she was going to work here and commute to Boston and maintain her social life in Boston. She quickly gave that up. <laughs> she, she went away. But Bob was a character, and he uh, and I drove to rounds at Milford Hospital every day for years. And in his car, which he affectionately named Kermit, <laughs> it was green. And Kermit had a life of its own, and so he and Bob were, he, Kermit and Bob were like this. And Bob would, uh, He'd start a sentence on the way to Milford. He'd, he'd go, the, uh... <laughs> what the hell was that? And I'd go, okay, what's next? And he'd do it again. He'd go, the, uh... And that was it. So this went on for years. I never really questioned him and really got into where, where his mind was, but he was pretty sharp. And whenever Kermit would stop at Milford Hospital, he'd go, Nyar. <laughs> so these are the beginnings of Tri River, and you know how I got into it was as a volunteer. I mean, there were a lot of ulterior motives. I was getting loans repaid and all that by joining the National Armed Service Corps. This was an underserved area, and I looked at other areas like Tomahawk, Wisconsin, and, and all that, which were from. But anyway, it grew as a, as a pediatrics and internal medicine practice, and uh, as a health center which serves whole valley uh, and has a uh, life of its own. Um, so that's pretty much it, just a little, little yeah, bit. We did have OB too. At some point we had OB. We, we had, had OB. OB. Yeah. 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 Which is where I am too, it's now. It's where there are doctors between story. examples. But yeah. just in the interest of time, again, I really appreciate uh, the three of you coming, you know, history and it's being, you know, thank you Chris for uh, recording it for posterity's sake and I hope everybody has you know, a little bit of um, knowledge now about the mission and why we're so um, uh, focused on and providing you know, quality care to the families of the area and, and on education. Um, so uh, people so have patients. So thank you for carrying on our, our mission. You're welcome. We're yes. happy, we're happy yes. to do that. And uh, again, very inspirational. And if people have questions, I know some people need to get upstairs for to see the patients. Um, if people have any questions, have you take it? The other kind of small point of note is that this was a dairy farm, right? Yes. And the rest of the, the land with the barn, right, is now the state park. Right. Uh, right. So, um, yeah, so again, very interesting kind of right. history. Collaboration. Yeah, exactly. Yes. One, one of the other things was that, too, when you were mentioning Mammoth Grants, some the, the, the Mammoth Grant machine, which I wrote the grant for, for the Mammoth Grant machine wow. because we were so underserved, we had so many people, women that were not, didn't have insurance and all that sort of stuff. So I wrote that grant. Do you remember that, Phil? For the Mammoth Grant, and we yeah. got it, and it was like, woohoo! Yeah. And I made the quilt. That's, that I don't see anymore. But well, it's, it's here now. It's it's we had to take it down during, okay. that, during COVID, COVID. but okay. it's back up. That has been remedied. Okay. Yes. 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 Because I'm a quilter. <laughs> yes. it's, it's interesting yeah. though. You know when the when the so the building was owned by the board. It was leased to the university. When we were mad at the university, I would threaten to throw them out, mm -hmm. um, and they never took me seriously. Um, and when they acquired the building, we wanted our bake sale money back. And so we actually got about, I don't know, $75,000 back. That was the original money that the community and others had uh, acquired bake sales from. Yeah, that's why I say a lot of brownies. Yeah. Lot of I, mean, I made chocolate cream pies, and this guy would come to me. And I, he, we were selling them at that time, like $5. And he'd come knock at the door and he'd say, if you, uh, I'll pay you for eight if you want, me, want to make eight chocolate cream pies. And I was like, okay. But, you know, not, not a horrible thing. And I was like, oh, I just got, you know, $40. And I was like, so happy, you know. But that was 
Well, I'm <laughs> <laughs> so thank you guys very much for sharing our mission.